Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your marvelous grace. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit and for the gift of your Son. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. And Lord, I pray that as your word is preached, that our minds would be attentive, our, our ears would listen, and our hearts would be receptive to receive the word of God as the word of God and not as the word of man. Lord, meet with each of us this day, and God, may we leave here changed. Now, may you bless the preaching of the word for the ultimate end of your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I would like to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That is where we will be today, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we will end our series entitled Blessed Hope Today. All right, we will end our series entitled Blessed Hope. And, uh, and so 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and primarily we're going to be looking at verses 23 uh, through 28. Those are the verses that we have left. This is the final unit in Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. So let's read that together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 through 28. Paul writes, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls is faithful, he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath, the Lord, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Well, as I was praying through this morning's message, uh, God gave me a very convicting thought. I always try to drive carefully when I'm driving my vehicle. P perhaps not as good as I should, but I do try to be careful. Uh, I, don't try, I don't text and drive. I try not to. I'm not saying that I never have, okay? But I really try to be a careful driver. But do you know when I'm most careful? is when I'm borrowing someone else's vehicle. Anybody else, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, how many of you in here, you try to be careful drivers, right? Just raise your hand, let's get active, right? Okay, so some of you just don't care, but a lot of you, <laughs> you a lot of you try to be careful drivers, all right? Now, let's just so that we're involved in the message, okay? How many of you are even more careful when you're driving someone else's vehicle? Yeah, that's right. Man, when I borrow someone else's vehicle, I make sure, I'm, I mean, I'm very careful about where I park, how close I'm parking to someone. You get the idea. Now, what you say, Pastor, where are you going with this? Here's where I'm going. The bodies that we have belong to God. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we've all been bought with a price. Now again, I'm talking to those of us who are saved. The Bible says that we've all been bought with a price. And that our bodies are no longer our own. But we are to now glorify God in our bodies. Why? Because our bodies belong to Him. And the price that He paid in order to redeem our bodies was not cheap. As a matter of fact, it was the shed blood of Christ that resulted in our redemption. So our bodies, our soul, our spirit no longer belong to us. They belong to God. And this life that we live now, it's to be lived out as if we are borrowing something from the Lord. Now let me ask you, how careful are you with your body? How careful are you with your eyes, the things you watch? How careful are you with your ears, the things you listen to? How careful are you with your tongue, the things you say? How careful are you with God's body?
that he has redeemed. The main emphasis of this final greeting that we have here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the main emphasis is this idea of sanctification. As a matter of fact, if you look there at your Bible, in verse 23, Paul says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Now in the Greek, that word sanctify is the word hagiosmos. It literally means holy. So what does it mean for someone to be sanctified? It means that they are bought with the price, the shed blood of Jesus, and they are now set apart to be used for God's glory. So you, when you were saved, you were set apart to be used for God. And when God saved you, he started this process of making you holy. That is sanctification. Those who are genuinely saved are being transformed from glory to glory. We are being made holy. We are being conformed into the image of Christ. So therefore, since our bodies do not belong to ourselves, they belong to God, we are borrowing them, what is our, responsibil- what is our responsibility? To treat these bodies holy. Every aspect of who we are, physical, spiritual, emotional, is to be treated carefully it is to be holy now when we come to this fourth major section here in Paul's letter the first three major sections being the letter's opening the thanksgiving part of the letter and then the letter's body now most scholars when they when they when they write commentaries or whatever it may be on 1 Thessalonians they give a lot of attention to those first three sections There's a lot of attention on the opening. There's a lot of attention on the uh, a lot of attention on the Thanksgiving, and a lot of attention is given to the body of the letter itself. But sadly, many neglect this final section, this final unit, this last benediction, if you will. Oftentimes, it's just mentioned in passing. Some believe it really has no hermeneutical significance or it really has no preaching significance I want you to know that with every letter that Paul closes he has a specific intent in the way he closes it as a matter of fact in this final section Paul closing the letter he echoes the theme of the letter in these final verses he echoes the themes For example, look at what he says in verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. Paul introduces God to them as the God of what? Peace. Well, what was one of the major themes of the letter? Was it not peace? Were they not anxious and worryful as it related to the second coming of Jesus? So Paul is now reflecting, recapitulating if you will. He's reflecting He's he's reminding them, as he concludes the letter, that they are to have peace. Why? Because God himself is the God of peace. He also gives them an encouraging word. Throughout the letter, Paul was constantly encouraging the church. Look at the encouraging word in verse 23. Now may the God of him peace sanctify you completely, and may your whole Spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the encouragement. Verse 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So once again, Paul's echoing that theme of encouragement. Did he not say to them several times throughout the letter, comfort one another with these words? Don't be anxious. Right? So he is the God of peace. So once again, we see these themes being echoed in the conclusion of Paul's letter. These are not haphazardly thrown together. Paul, once again, is teaching his hearers very vital truths about God. 
Don't be anxious. Why? Because God is the God of peace. Encourage one another or be encouraged. Why? Because he who calls you is faithful. Now listen, that's, this is not even my sermon. But this is a sermon for some of you this morning. You need to be reminded that in the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of your worry, that God is the God of peace. Others need to be encouraged this morning. Perhaps you're downhearted or whatever it may be, you're, you're downcast. And, and the Lord says, he who, listen, God is faithful. And he who called you is going to complete this good work in you that he started. Right? So do you see these themes being echoed? Now, why am I emphasizing this? Because Paul does this very thing in all of the letters that he closes. And sadly, so many of us, when we read Paul's writings, we get to the end, and what do we do? We just wrap it up. We don't stop and think about the theological implications of the last conclusion itself. Now, he also reminds them of the fellowship that they are to have with one another. Like all churches, this church, is, this church had some, there was a little bit of friction within the body. At Thessalonica. So Paul addresses that theme as well. Look at what he says. Verse 25. Brothers, pray for us and greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. So what's Paul doing in that section? Paul is reminding them what? That they're to get along. <laughs> That they're, to, that, that, that they're to have unity within the body. And then what do we have? Finally, we have this final benediction where Paul says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So Paul skillfully, do you see it? Paul skillfully wraps up this letter by echoing the major themes. Praise the Lord. Let us be reminded as we conclude this series that in this life we will have tribulation. In this life there will be trial. In this life there will be suffering. But the reality of those facts should not cast a shadow concerning the reality that Christ could come at any moment. He is a God of peace. He is faithful. We are to be encouraged by that. And we are to live in unity until Christ returns. Right? Now, this is how I see the structure of this final section. So look at the screen. This is how this final section is structured. The letter's closing, verses 23 through 28. This is how it's structured. He gives a peace benediction in verse 23. All right? The God of peace. And then he gives them a word of encouragement in verse 24. And then there's a horatory or a, a, an exhortation in verse 25. And then we have this kiss greeting that he talks about, this greeting in verse 26. And then once again, we have another exhortation, another exhortation section in verse 27. And then the final benediction, the grace benediction in verse 28. All right? So this is how this final section is structured, right? But I would say to you, what is the major theme of this final section? Now we see how Paul skillfully echoes the major themes of the letter. Now we see how the structure, the, 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 the unit itself is structured. But what is it that we are going to camp on? What is it that, that carries the most weight, if you will? Because not everything carries the most weight. So what is it that carries the most weight in this passage of Scripture? Here it is. Verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Paul's desire for them is that they be holy. As they anticipate the return of Jesus Christ. So as it relates, and by the way, that word sanctify could be translated holy too. So as it relates to sanctification, as it relates to holiness, 
I want to speak to your life individually. I want to speak to your life personally. Okay, here it is. My first point this morning. God works powerfully in His people. God works powerfully in His people. Isn't that good news? To know that when God saves you, God does not leave you to yourself. But God saves you, and then then you know what He does? He saves you, and then He works powerfully in you. Where do we see that in the text? Now may the God of peace Himself. You see that? Now may the God of peace Himself do what? Sanctify you. Make you holy. Completely. So as we think about this reality of being transformed into the image of Christ, here's something I want you to understand. At the moment of your salvation, when you trusted in Christ by faith and were born again, that very moment, God started a work of sanctification in your life. God did. At the moment of your salvation, God began to conform you and transform you. Your desires begin to change. Your want to's begin to change. The things that you used to love, you begin to hate. And the things you used to hate, you, you now love. I mean, I can tell you right now, in my life, on April the 14th of the year 2000, at that moment that God saved me, and I was born again, there was a work of sanctifying grace that began in my life. And it's continuing on to this day. When God saved me, God himself, God himself began to work powerfully in me. And the things I used to do, I didn't want to do anymore. As a matter of fact, my old running buddies, they would call me up and they'd say, Hey, do you want to go do this? You fill in the blank. And I would say, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. But if you want to go fishing or if you just want to talk about things, I'm more than happy to do that. But I'm not going to go with you and do the things that I used to do anymore. Why? Because God was doing this sanctifying work in my life. The Spirit of God was now indwelling me. And the Spirit of God was now working within me and changing my desires and changing my want to's. And and now for almost 20 years, God has been faithful to work powerfully in me and to continue to conform me into the image of Christ. I am being made holy. Now God has his hands full. I can tell you that right now. With me. Okay? As I'm sure he does with you. But here's something that we all need to understand. Is that God himself is the author of your sanctification. God himself is the administrator of your sanctification. That's why it's absolutely absurd for someone to say, I'm saved, but yet they're not changed. That's not true salvation. Because when God truly saves a person, he changes a person. Right? The proof of justification. Justification is what? They get declaration of unguilt. When God truly justifies a person, when he forgives a person, when he saves a person, he at the same time sanctifies a person. That's why James would say, faith without works is dead. James was not saying that you have to work to be saved. James was saying if you truly have faith, it will be accompanied by what? Your sanctification. So when God saves you, God works powerfully in you. So when the Thessalonians embraced the gospel, at that moment, God set them apart for holiness. On April the 14th of the year 2000, at that moment, when by God's grace and by His Spirit, I embraced the gospel, God began the work of holiness in my life. And to this day, just like with the Thessalonians, that work of sanctification is progressing. Therefore, they could take comfort, and we too can take comfort, that the God of peace 
is working powerfully in our lives. Now, in order for us to truly understand and appreciate Paul's request here for sanctification, there's three dimensions of sanctification I want to share with you. The first dimension of sanctification is past. In other words, your sanctification is past. When God saved you, what did He do? He set you apart. You now have a new standing. So, sanctification secures our standing. Before my salvation, my standing was, I was lost. Before my salvation, my standing was, I was an enemy of God. Before my salvation, my standing was, I was under the wrath of God. Right? Just like all of us. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. Ephesians chapter 2, we were all dead in our trespasses and sin, and by nature disobedient. And as a result, we were under the wrath of God. Romans chapter 5, while we were still sinners, at the right time God sent His Son to die for us. goes on to say that while, if God died for His enemies... If God demonstrated His love by dying for His enemies, how much more does God love us now that we're not His enemies, right? So our standing has been changed. When you trusted in Christ, listen, the moment you trusted in Christ, God set you apart. He set you apart. So therefore, in a sense, your sanctification is past. Why? Because your standing has been changed. Paul said, any man that's what? In Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Any man that's in Christ is a new creature. All things have become new and old things have passed away, right? So no longer am I in the world. No longer am I in sin. No longer am I in darkness. But I've been transferred, Colossians chapter 1, I've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Now I am in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1, I am now adopted into the family of God. My standing has been changed. That's already happened. It's a past event that can never be changed. There's absolute security in our standing. Why? Because God himself did it. Who set us apart? Who sanctified us? Who is the, who is the one who calls our standing to change you me who is the one God did and so God changed our standing and since our standing has been changed by God himself our standing is secure in Christ right so there's a there's that one dimension where our sanctification is past why? Because our standing has changed. But there's also a second dimension where our sanctification is present. Because I've been set apart, God is now what? Making me holy. So one is positional, the other one is practical. Are you following that? Positionally, my, listen, positionally, my standing has changed. And if my standing has truly changed, it will be made manifest through the practical living of my life. So not, listen, so not only does God change your standing, God is presently doing what? He ensures that you are progressing in holiness. Who's doing it? God Himself. So God changed your standing and now God is working powerfully in your life to conform you into the image of Christ. That's why when you're convicted of sin and you repent, it's not a good idea that you had. Well, I'm a pretty holy person. I caught that sin and I turned away from it. No, it was the sovereign God himself of the entire universe working in your life. It was God by His Spirit working in you to convict you and to change you and to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. Fathers, the longing that we have, and I know we don't do it per perfectly, but fathers, the longing, Christian fathers, the longing that we have to love our wives as Christ loved the church, that's God Himself at work in us. 
Fathers, the desire that we have to raise our children up under the fear and the love and the admonition of God. Listen, that's not a good idea that we had. That's God himself working in us. The desire that we have to read God's word and to commune with God and to pray to God. Listen, it's God himself at work in us. When we've wronged a person and we feel the guilt that brings us to shame and then ultimately repentance and we say we're sorry, that's God himself working in us. You say, well, can't un- unsaved people? Can't unsaved people say they're sorry? Can't unsaved people do a lot of those things you just described? Yes, but they don't do it unto the glory of God. Ultimately, when a lost person tries to do something right, deep down inside, In the recesses of their depravity, it is for selfish gain. But when a Christian who is truly being worked on by the Holy Spirit of God himself, we do it unto the glory of God. How could I be, how could I despise the gospel the way that I am? All right? So check it out. Three dimensions. Past sanctification, God changed your standing. Present sanctification, God is conforming you into the image of Christ. But then there's the third dimension of sanctification. What is it? It's future. It's future. Sanctification guarantees our future. Listen to this. Follow this right now. If you are sanctified, then your standing is secure with God. If you are being sanctified, sanctification ensures the progress will what? will go on till when? Until Christ returns. Future sanctification guarantees our future glorification. Because I'm being sanctified right now, I know that one day I'll be glorified. So, some of these we might say are subjective. I mean, having our standing changed, being taken out of the kingdom of darkness... And being put into the kingdom of God's Son. We could say, well, that's subjective. Anybody could say that. But what's objective is if you're truly, your standing has been changed, it will be made manifest in your life. If there is no evidence of progressive sanctification in your life, if there's no evidence whatsoever that you're being transformed and, to, and conformed into the image of Christ, then you have no reason to believe that your standing's ever been changed. But if you do have a longing and a desire for the things of God, an ever-increasing an ever-increasing longing to thirst after God and be near God, if there is true evidence that your life is being changed, then you can know without a shadow of a doubt that your standing's been changed and that the promise of glorification is yours. One day, what does the scripture say? Look at it. Now may the God of peace himself do what? Who's doing it? Sanctify you completely. When does complete sanctification happen? At glorification, when we are made perfect. Who does it? God himself. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you say, well, that's great, but how do I know it's really going to happen? He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So, I want to look at a passage of Scripture right quick that kind of ties all these things together. My sanctification ensures my standing. Sanctification ensures that I am going to to progressively be made holy. And sanctification guarantees my future. Look at Romans chapter 8. You see, this is truly a work of God in Romans 8. Look at Romans 8, verse 29. Romans 8, verse 29. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. What did he predestine them to? Look at the scripture. Predestined them to be what? 
conformed to the image of his son. That is sanctification defined. Sanctification is being conformed into the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined he called. And those whom he called he justified. And those whom he justified he also glorified. So God foreknows, God predestines, God calls, God justifies, God sanctifies, God glorifies. So your salvation from beginning to end is a sovereign work of God himself. That's why we know without a shadow of a doubt that God works powerfully in his people. For someone to say that they're saved by grace and they're not changed is like saying that you were run over by a loaded log truck and you were not injured. Did you get that? If you walk in here today and you say, I was run over as I was crossing the street by a loaded log truck, I would say, and you have no injuries, I would say, you're a lunatic or you're a tremendous liar. For someone to say that they've been saved by grace, but they're not being transformed, is the same type of insanity. Because when God saves a person, He changes a person. When God justifies a man, He sanctifies a man. And those whom God justifies, He sanctifies. And those who are being sanctified will be glorified. Why? Because God Himself will see to it. Amen. So, you say, well, don't we have a responsibility? Are we supposed to just let go and let God? No. We do have a responsibility. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So on one hand, God does it himself. On the other hand, you have a responsibility for your own sanctification. God is making you holy, but on the other hand, we have a responsibility to do what? To pursue holiness. But check this out. As we pursue holiness, it's actually God Himself who's doing the work. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, but knowing that ultimately it's God who is at work, what? In you to do both according to His will. Ephesians chapter 2. So we have a responsibility. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are to pursue holiness. I can't just sit in front of a TV with some type of ungodliness on and say, well, if God doesn't want me to watch it, He'll zap my television. Or if God didn't want me looking at this certain thing on YouTube or the Internet, then He would just zap my cell phone. No, we have a responsibility to to put ourselves positionally each day to grow in holiness. And those desires that we have to position ourselves for holiness is God Himself. And as we pursue holiness and as we're transformed into holiness, it's no reason for our boasting, it's God Himself doing it. So on the one hand, God Himself is sanctifying. On the other hand, we have a responsibility to pursue holiness. Paul himself says this in the letter. He just said, Now may the God God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May God do it. And then he says, God will do it. May God do it. And then he says, God will do it in verse 24. And so Paul tells us that this sanctification is a sovereign work of God. But then when we back up to chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says this. For this is the will of God. Your what? For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. God's doing it on one hand, but on the other hand, you have a responsibility to abstain from those things which you know are displeasing to the Lord. And ultimately, as you progress in holiness, praise the King of glory, because He's the one doing it in you. So let us, amen, praise the Lord. So let us not forget this morning that God works powerfully in His people. Number two, God gives wonderful promises to His people. God gives wonderful promises to His people. 
What's the wonderful promise? Look at the verse. And by the way, in the Greek text, I love this. In the Greek text, that word himself is first. In our English Bible, it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. In the Greek text, it says, Himself, God. Making sure that we understand that it's God doing it. Himself, God. Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. That's literally how it reads in the Greek text. Himself, God of peace, sanctify you. To make sure that there's no doubt whatsoever that this is God's work. But notice the wonderful promise that God gives His people. Yes, we know that God works powerfully in His people, but God also gives wonderful promises to His people. Look at the text. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body. This is not a time for an argument concerning whether you're tripartite or bipartite, and some of you don't even know what that means, and that's okay. It's not like a mosquito bite. But here's the thing. Did you get that? Okay, some of you did. If you're a preacher, you got it, because they all ended in what? Ite. Okay. But, but this is not a time for that type of theological argument. There is a time for, are we tripartite beings? Are we bipartite beings? What are we? But but Paul's not writing this in order to have a theological argument. Paul's writing this to simply say that every aspect of who you are, God's going to sanctify completely. One day, your emotions are going to be completely glorified. One day, your body is going to be completely glorified. And that old Adamic nature that still lives within us is one day going to be rooted out. And every aspect of who we are completely from the top of our head to the soles of our feet, inward, outward, every aspect of who we are will be glorified. What's the promise? And God Himself, who is faithful, will surely see to it. That's the promise. What a wonderful promise. God's going to see to it that you're made perfect. God's going to see to it that if you are saved, that you progress in holiness. God's going to see to it that one day you are completely made perfect. When? He's going to keep you blameless. Oh, man. He's He's going to completely sanctify you. God is. He's going he's gonna to keep you blameless. And he promises to do it. He'll surely do it, he says, because he's faithful. So that you'll be ready, what? At the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, friend, it doesn't get any better than that right now. It doesn't get any better than that. What a wonderful promise God has given to his people. He works powerfully in you, and He gives you wonderful promises. He is going to present you, those of us who are truly saved, born of God's Spirit, He is going to present us one day to Christ, blameless, and completely sanctified at the coming of Christ. Oh, does that not encourage your heart? Why would he do this? Because he's the God of peace. And when Christ returns, God is going to present, if you will, Christ won a victory, did he not? And whenever, when someone wins a victory, what do they usually receive? A trophy? At the coming of Christ, God the Father himself is going to give beautiful, perfect trophies to his son because of his victory upon the cross. And those of us who are saved, we are those trophies. And because of that unconditional, undeniable truth, we are to be pursuing holiness right now. 
Isn't that the proper response to grace? That we pursue holiness? So I've shared with you two things so far. God works powerfully in His people. God's going to do it. He'll see that it happens. Secondly, God gives wonderful promises to His people. He'll surely see to it that you're sanctified completely. It's going to happen if you're saved. Praise the Lord. And then lastly, God manifests His presence through His people. And that's for us right now. God wants to manifest His presence through you. Did you know that? That as we go out into this world, and as we interact with each other as a congregation, God desires to manifest His presence through us. How so? First, by praying for one another. Look at what he says. Brothers, pray for us. As we pray for one another, it is God, listen, it is God manifesting his presence through us. Secondly, as we encourage one another, He says, greet all brothers with a holy kiss. So he's talking about pray for each other. Then what's he talking about in in verse 26? Encouraging one another. Now, I gave out a lot of hugs this morning. Now, don't do it just because I'm asking. But if you were encouraged by the hug the pastor gave you, would you just raise your hand? If it encouraged you in some way. Not very many of you. Okay, so that's all right. I'll keep doing it. But all right. But some of you were encouraged. All right? Normally I, walk through our, normally I walk through our church and I'll shake hands on Sunday morning. But this morning, in light of this sermon, I said, you know what, I'm going to give people hugs. Now, this says holy kiss. Well, I don't know if we're quite ready for all that, but here's the thing. <laughs> Sometimes a handshake can be quite formal, can it? Formal. But giving someone a hug. Is just a little bit more encouraging. Right? So as a congregation, God desires to manifest His presence through us. Praying for each other. Encouraging one another. And then thirdly, growing together. Do you know that? That God manifests His presence through us as we grow together? Look at what He says. Where do you see that at? He says in verse 27, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Why did he want this letter read to all? Because he wanted all of them to do what? To grow together. So God works powerfully in his people. God is sanctifying us. Past, our standing has changed. Present, we're being conformed into the image of Christ. Future, one day we're going to be glorified. And then God gives wonderful promises to His people. One day God's going to sanctify us completely. He's going to make us perfect. We are going to be glorified and we will be presented to Christ blameless. And now we see that God manifests His presence through His people. How? By the way we pray for each other. And the way we encourage one another. And the way we grow together. So, grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I leave you with these three concluding thoughts as a way of application. Number one, I want you to know this morning that if you are saved, God has taken special interest in you. God sought you out. God drew you to to himself. God saved you. God has taken special interest in you. And if you are saved, God's working powerfully in your life. You may not think it, and times you may not see it, but listen, don't you ever doubt it. Why? Because this is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. It's not that God's not doing His part, but there may be times in our lives where we're not doing ours, right? And then thirdly, 
God manifest his presence transparently through his people as we pray, as we encourage, and as we grow together. God has taken special interest in you. Number two, the time to get serious about personal holiness is now. Christ is coming. God himself is doing the work on the one hand, but on the other hand, we are to pursue holiness. Wendy, listen, if you are not doing your part, it's vitally important that you get serious about personal holiness right now. Right now. Your body does not belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. And we have a responsibility to take care of it. So get serious about personal holiness right now. Lastly, remember that God is not only at work in you, but he's also at work in other people. So be patient with them. Be patient with other people. The work that God's doing in you, he's doing in them. And some have progressed further than others. But never forget, that person that may frustrate you or may get on your nerves, who is a brother or sister in Christ, just as God is at work in you, He's in work in them. Be patient. So listen, congregation. Pray for one another. Right? Pray for one another. Get serious about holiness. And be patient with other people. And be encouraged that God works powerfully in His people. God gives wonderful promises to His people. And that God manifests His presence transparently through His people. Amen? I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your heads with me this morning in prayer. Perhaps as you heard this sermon, you were honest and say, you know what, I'm not being sanctified. There's no evidence whatsoever in my life that I've been changed. Yeah, I've prayed prayers and I've walked aisles and I've gone through all those outward things. But at the end of the day, there's no evidence in my life whatsoever that I'm being changed, that I'm being transformed. You say, Pastor, what should I do? Listen, would you call out to the Lord Jesus right where you are? Would you just call out to him and say, Lord, grant me the faith to believe. Grant me the repentance to turn. I don't want this to be a work of my own. I want this to be a work of your grace. So Lord Jesus, would you, would you right now from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, Would you cleanse me? Jesus, I'm asking that you make me new. That you forgive me of my sin. And I'm trusting in you, Jesus, alone for my salvation. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask everyone to stand. And if you prayed this morning to Christ for eternal salvation, would you walk up to one of our pastors? As a matter of fact, pastors, let's go ahead and stand. Would you walk up to one of our pastors up here at the front? I'll be down here as well. Would you walk up to one of us and just say, you know what? This morning, I've given my life to Christ. I felt the draw of His Holy Spirit. I feel as though I've been made new right here where I'm sitting. I feel as though the Spirit of God has has cleansed me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I want you to pray for me. Would you come here in just a moment? Others of us, maybe you just need to come. and Right now, just... Begin to pray for pray for your responsibility. Sometimes we're just like our kids. We tell our kids to clean their rooms and all they do is shove everything to the corners. And then we have to come in and say, shoving things to the corners is not cleaning your room. Listen, what type of things have you shoved to the corners? Because God wants you to clean those things up and He'll help you. Perhaps you'd like to come and kneel down and say, God, show me those those corners in my life that need to be cleaned out. Humble yourself before the Lord this morning. Maybe you're looking for a church home where you know the Word's going to be preached. 
Well, I would like for you to, perhaps, if God's doing that in your life this morning, come during this time of invitation and let us talk with you about membership. You come. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads?